thank you, Lord. And we thank you for this morning, um, Revelation, that you're going to bring. We're very excited about what you're going to show us this weekend. And we just decree that everything will only come from the Holy Spirit. And that everybody's hearts will be open to completely understanding all the revelation. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, this is a series. And in it, I'm going to talk about more revelation about the soul. In this series, though, I'm going to really focus on idols. And how images of idols get burned on your soul. Okay. And you're not going to believe the stuff that happens to you when an image of an idol is burned on your soul, it can affect every part of your life. It can control the way you think. It can control your will, your decisions that you make. It can control your emotions. Okay. It can hinder your walk with God. It can block you from hearing the voice of God. It can block you from receiving visions in the spiritual realm. In fact, images of idols on your soul can completely hinder every one of your spiritual gifts, from the prophetic to the moving in miracles gift, to words of knowledge gift. Having an image on your soul can affect and hinder all your giftings. And if you have an image of an idol on your soul, it can cause you major sickness and disease. You're not going to believe tonight when you hear the different disorders that can come upon you when you have an image of an idol on your soul. I mean, it, it, it is the basic cause for every major disease from cancer to fibromyalgia to Parkinson's to arthritis to lupus to uh, stomach disorders to feet disorders, everything. It can, and when you have an image of an idol on your soul, it can even cause you to be deaf, dumb, blind, and crippled. I'm going to show it to you all through the word. Amen. As I begin... I want to lay a foundation about the soul. Some of you have heard me teach on this before, and so you're going to think, mm, we've already heard this before. Well, you're going to hear it again, <laughs> and it's going to be great. For the first 15 minutes, I need to lay, relay this foundation because the rest of these six sessions is going to be built upon this foundation. So stick with me while I relay the foundation about the soul. What constitutes the soul man? The mind, the will, and the emotions make up our soul. We're three-part beings, body, soul, and spirit. When we were born again in Christ Jesus, our spirit man was made instantly perfect. The Bible says that the same spirit that lives in Christ lives in us. So there is nothing wrong with our spirit man because it is Christ. But when we were born again, our soul man was not made instantly perfect. Our mind, our will, and our emotions are constantly under the process of being healed and brought into the lordship of Jesus Christ. That's why 1 Corinthians 10 says that we're, it commands us to take every thought into captivity that would set itself up against God into submission to Jesus. That indicates that our minds aren't, aren't perfect, that there's a process of our minds becoming perfected and healed. So our spirit man is made instantly perfect, but our souls are not upon our salvation. And how many of you know that our souls are a mess? Okay. Throughout our lives, our souls have become wounded, the Bible says, and mainly from two sources that we're going to talk about right now, traumatic circumstances and sin. Let's look at traumatic circumstances and how they wound the soul. Painful events can wound your soul. A, a tragic accident or a death of a family member can literally leave a scar on your inner man. Doctors in the natural will tell you if you, go, if you undergo some kind of a trauma, it can scar you. It can affect the way you think. It can affect your, your choices. It can affect your emotions. And doctors in the natural will also tell you that if you undergo some kind of a trauma, that it can actually eventually cause you a physical disease, even a deadly one. Amen? <clears throat> Trauma can wound you and lead to all sorts of trouble in your life. Let's look at a biblical example of someone who was traumatized and they got wounded in their soul because of it. The example is in the life of Job. In chapter 1 of Job, we read that Job lost everything he owned. He lost his, his oxen, his donkey, his sheep, his camels, when raiders came and took them. And then all his children were killed 
when they were gathered in one house together and a whirlwind came and brought the house crashing down upon them. Then in chapter 2, we see Job is physically afflicted. He gets afflicted from the top of his head to the soles of his feet with painful boils. All those traumatic events and circumstances ended up wounding Job's soul. We know that because throughout the entire book of Job, he's constantly speaking about the pain and the bitterness that's in his soul that has happened since these events happened in his life. Just a couple examples. Or in Job 3, it says, Why is light of life given to him who is in misery and life to the bitter in soul? Here, Job is saying, look, <laughs> I don't even want to live. I wish I was dead. And he's saying that because of the bitterness he had in his soul from the traumatic events that he had undergone. In chapter 7 and verse 3, it says that he's talking again about the same topic, about wanting to die because of the bitterness in his soul. He said, I've been allotted months of futility. Nights of misery have been assigned to me. My eyes will never see happiness again. Therefore, I will not keep silent. I will speak out of the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Again, he's saying, I have become so wounded from what has happened to me that I want to die. I don't even want to live. How many of you have had a traumatic event happen in your life? You know, even the people who think that they might not have, we'd be amazed at what will traumatize us. But because the human, um, the human spirit is so strong, we're, we're survivors. We go, oh no, we shake it off. No, no, I'm okay. I'm okay. When in, when in fact, an incident has wounded us. But look, how many people, raise your hands again. Almost every single person in here has had a traumatic event happen in their lives. Do you think that means you're wounded? It's true. It's true. Now let's talk about sin and how sin wounds the soul. Whether someone sins against you or you sin against yourself, Sin wounds your soul. Maybe someone sinned against you. They abused you. They molested you. They neglected you, rejected you. That sin wounded your soul. Maybe you sinned against yourself. You got involved in pornography or, or drugs or crime. Or maybe you just did something simple like over, chronic overeating. Those sins can wound your soul. Now let's look at different examples in the Bible. Let's first look at how someone sinning against us can wound our soul. In 1 Corinthians 8, it says this. And when you sin against your brethren in this way, wounding and damaging their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. According to this, when someone sins against their brother, it can, quote, wound their weak conscience. That word conscience in the Greek means the soul. So according to this, when someone sins against someone else, that sin can literally wound that person's soul. And that's sinning against Christ. Now what happens when you sin against yourself? Is there biblical proof about that? Yes. In Isaiah 30, 26, in the Amplified, it says this. The Lord binds up the hurts of his people and heals their wound inflicted by him because of their sin. According to that scripture, when we sin, it can create a wound in our soul. Another proof is in Micah. Micah 6.13, it says, Therefore I have smitten you with a deadly wound. I've made you sick, laying you desolate, waste, and deserted because of your sins. Many people will say, well, you're reading that scripture and you're talking about a wound. It means a physical wound. But how come this scripture differentiates it? It says that you'll be stricken with a wound and made sick. There's a difference there. The wound it's talking about is a wound that comes upon your inner man when you sin. And that wound is so strong that it can also make you sick. Amen? The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Do you feel, do you think that based on that scripture alone that everyone in the planet is wounded in their soul? It's true, every person in the planet is wounded in their soul. Now, once you get a wound in your soul, it can control every part of your soul. It can control your mind, the, the thoughts that you think, the way you think about things. It can control your will, your ability to choose rightly from wrongly. 
It's like, do you understand that sometimes when you're making important choices and they go awry, the choice doesn't work? It was probably that that thing didn't work because you made that choice out of a wound in your soul. <clears throat> Did you understand what I just said? You're making important life decisions out of a wounded soul. And that's why some of the times when you're making these decisions on starting a business or purchasing a home or, or where to send your kids and the things don't work out, you're like, what happened, God? Because you maybe thought you were hearing from the Spirit of God when you were actually hearing from your wounded soul. Did you hear what I said? Okay. What's ever in your soul can control your soul. The Apostle Paul he talks about it in Romans seven twenty. He says this, now if I do what I do not desire to do, it's no longer I doing it. It's not myself that acts, but it's the sin principle which dwells within me, fixed and operating in my soul. <clears throat> See, once you have a wound in your soul, it can control every part of your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions, and it can make you sin. That wound was made by sin, but once it's there, it can make you sin. Here, Paul's saying he was doing the things he didn't want to do because the sin nature fixed and operating in his soul. He was saying, the junk in my trunk is making me sin. Amen? Jesus. Okay, now, <clears throat> I'm just laying a foundation. I rebuke that. <clears throat> Thank you. Now, if all that weren't bad enough, because wounds in your soul are created by sin, it gives demonic powers the legal right to torment you. You see, sin is an open door for the enemy. It gives the enemy the legal right to come in and attack you in every area of your life. We, we, we've never really understood that when sin comes, it gives the enemy a legal right to come after us but that sin creates a wound in our soul. So actually, when the enemy comes to attack us, he's actually going after what's in our soul. Because what's in our soul that came from the sin is what's giving him the legal right. That's why when you put the blood of Jesus on your sin, and you continually rebuke a demon and it doesn't leave, you're going, what's going on? How come this isn't working? Because you didn't understand, you put the blood of Jesus on the sin, but there was a wound made by that sin, and that demon still using that wound as a legal right to assault you. So you were putting the blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus on the sin, but the wound was still there. So is the demon. You're going, what's going on? The blood of Jesus works, doesn't it? Yeah. It takes care of the sin. Did you hear what I said? I'm going to show you this afternoon that we've been missing something. We've been applying the blood of Jesus on the sin our whole lives, and the blood has been doing what it's supposed to do. It's been wiping away the sin that wounded your soul. But it left behind a wound, and we needed to use another characteristic of Jesus to heal that wound. And when the wound got healed, then the spirit would have to leave. That characteristic of Jesus is his glory and his light, which comes through the resurrection. You see, we've been partaking of the cross, but not of the resurrection. And I'm going to show you that this afternoon. <clears throat> it's true. When you hear this afternoon's message, it's going to blow your mind. You're going to be like, I can't believe it. Wow. This is what we've been missing for centuries. And it's the resurrection, the power, the dunamis power that comes through the resurrection. The enemy's getting its legal right to attack you because of the wounds in your soul. The enemy goes after your soul. Psalms 143 says, For the enemy has pursued and persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life down to the ground. He's made me dwell in dark places as those who have long been dead. You see, according to this verse, the place in your life that the enemy is targeting is your soul. He was there back in 1963 when your father abandoned you. He was there back in 1979 when you had a divorce because of that abandonment issue. He was there back in 1990 when you started to drink because of the divorce. He was there when your soul was wounded. So he knows. And that's why the scripture says he pursues and persecutes your soul. Amen? 
<clears throat> do you know that one of the reasons why the enemy did not have any power over Jesus is because Jesus had no wounds in his soul formed by sin. When Jesus came here to earth, he came here as a man. It says in Philippians 2 that Jesus stripped him, oh, stripped himself of all privileges and rightful dignity so as to assume the guise of a servant, a slave, and that he became like men and was born a human being. Can you imagine? Jesus Christ gave up all of his rights for deity, set them aside temporarily so he could come here as completely man. Why would he do that? He had to come here as a man without sin because if he didn't, he could not have been the perfect atoning sacrifice for the rest of mankind. So he had to come as totally man, but without sin. And he also came as totally man because if he had come as what he is, very God of very God, then anything he did, do you think you would think you'd be able to do it too? No. You'd be like, well, he could do it because he was God. No, the point is that he came as a human being without sin so we could go, he did it, which means we can too. <clears throat> Jesus came as a man without sin. Now, because he came as a man, that meant he was built just like us. He had a body, a soul, and a spirit, right? Now, we know his spirit is perfect because we get our perfected spirit from him. But unlike us, Jesus' soul was perfect too. You see, the Bible says that Jesus had no sin, and since sin makes the wound, and he had no sin, that means he had no wound in his soul, which means there was nothing in Jesus for the enemy to pursue and persecute to do a Psalm 143 to Jesus. There was nothing in Jesus that was in common with demonic spirits. That's why he as a man had power over them. Jesus talks about that in John 14. He says, I will not talk with you much more for the prince, the evil genius ruler of the world is coming and he has no claim on me. He has nothing in common with me. There's nothing in me that belongs to him. So he has no power over me. See, one of the reasons why Jesus, as a man, had complete dominion over every demonic spirit is because he had nothing in his soul that was in common with those spirits. <clears throat> so they could not pursue and persecute him. And we see the truth of that playing out throughout Scripture. In Luke 4, there's an example <clears throat> of a man in the synagogue. Remember the man in the synagogue? Jesus delivers him of a foul spirit. And what happens when Jesus comes up to that man and begins to deliver him, that spirit cries out, ah, oh, let us alone. What do you have to do with us? What have we in common, Jesus of Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? See, that spirit's recognizing the truth of what Jesus said in John 14. The prince of this world is coming, but he has nothing in me that's in common with him, so he has no power over me. He's recognizing the truth of that scripture. He's saying, what is there in common between us? Have you come to destroy us? So that, script, that spirit is recognizing that he has nothing, Jesus has nothing in his soul that's in common with that spirit. So not only can that spirit not torment Jesus, but Jesus can torment him. It's the same thing in Mark 5 with a man with a spirit of legion. Remember that? Legion drives that man down at the feet of Jesus. And what does that spirit say to Jesus? Oh, Jesus, what have we in common? Have you, please do not begin to torment me. That spirit of legion, same thing. That spirit recognized that Jesus had nothing in his soul that was in common with him, so he could not torment Jesus, but in fact, Jesus could torment him. Do you understand that spirits are able to torment you because of you have things in your soul that are in common with it? Did you hear what I said? When you get those healed and you have nothing in common, then what will happen is the spirit that is coming at you on an assignment will do the same thing the spirits did when they came at Jesus. They'll go, whoa, what is there in common? Do not begin to torment me. How many of you want a demon to beg you not to torment it? Yes. That will happen when you get your soul healed and you don't have anything in common with the spirit that's on assignment against you. Amen? Amen. Do you understand? Okay. All right, I want to point out two other things. 
How many of you prayed for somebody and it didn't work? <laughs> Come on. Oh, everybody. Okay. How many of you have been praying for your kids for years or something, or somebody for years and it hasn't worked? Do you know why it doesn't work? Let me tell you why. Because you have a wound in your soul that's in common with a wound in their soul. And the same spirit that's on them is also on you because you have stuff in common with them. Maybe it's your kids. They wounded you. Probably because you wounded them first. That's why you notice when somebody else prays for your kids, it works better than when you pray for your kids. Because there's no in common. You understand? When you begin to remove the things that are in you that are in common with the person you're praying for, you're going to see the miracle happen. That spirit's going, if you have something in common, it won't work, because that spirit is standing there going, mm, yeah, you're trying to kick me off of them, but I'm on you too. Good luck with that. It's true. Okay, let me point out another thing to you. <clears throat> Wounds in your soul get passed down from generation to generation. You ever heard of a generational curse? It's passed down from generation to generation, right? Where do you think generational curses get passed down in? The soul. A generational curse cannot land on your perfected spirit man. It is Jesus Christ. So what does that leave behind? That means that all the curses, the generational curses, are carried in your soul. It's the same thing with wounds. Amen? You know how they get transferred? In the womb. Look up the word womb. In the Strong's, in the New Testament, it says the word womb means the place where the fetus is conceived and nurtured until birth, but it also means this, the inner man, the soul. Did you hear what I said? In the womb, wounds and generational curses are passed down to you. So you're carrying stuff that you didn't even do. Wow, that's scary. Okay, that's my review. <clears throat> Now let's get to the message. <laughs> Attached to every wound is a demonic spirit. These spirits can affect your entire life, including your prosperity and your health. What does it say in 3 John 1? It says that I pray you be prospered, there's your money, and be in health, there's your physical body. Say it with me. Even as your soul prospers. You see, it's as your soul prospers and gets healed that you're going to have a breakthrough in your finances and your physical health. Amen? We're going to talk about the health later on, but I just want to talk about demonic powers and their ability to attach themselves to wounds in your soul and how they make you sick. Right? I'm just going to give you one example because we're going to talk about this through the rest of the conference, but I just am laying a foundation right now. In Acts 10, it says this, that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was anointed with Holy Spirit and power, and he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. So Jesus was anointed with power. That word power there in the Greek is the word dunamis. Two of the meanings in the Greek of the word dunamis are this, the power to perform miracles and to be excellent of soul. Yes, I want you to think about it. That means Jesus had this power called dunamis, right? And he goes around doing good with it, healing all those that were oppressed by the devil. So what's he doing? He's going around, and when you see him doing all these miracles where people are getting healed in their physical body and all kinds of diseases and disorders are being broken off, what's he doing? He's releasing dunamis on them. That's giving him the power to perform that miracle. But the reason why that miracle is happening in their physical body is because they're becoming what dunamis means, excellent of soul. Jesus is using his anointing of dunamis to heal people's souls. And when people's souls get healed, then they are three John 1, prospered and brought into health even as their soul is prospered. You got to understand, yes, that Jesus, when he was healing people in their physical bodies, they were getting the miracle because they were being healed in their soul. They were becoming what dunamis means, excellent of soul. Amen? <clears throat> now let's look at an example in the Bible of somebody who was sick because they had a wound in their soul. And that same wound en enabled a demonic spirit to attach itself to them. In Luke 13, it talks about the woman bowed over. Remember? 
says, verse 11, and behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift herself up. Okay, this woman had a spirit of infirmity on her. That spirit was literally bending her bones. She was bent over. She couldn't lift herself up. What gave a spirit the legal right to literally bend her spine over? It was a wound in her soul. That's what gave that spirit the legal right. How do I know? Because it says that she had a spirit of infirmity. That word infirmity in the Greek means this. Listen, weakness and infirmity of the body and of the soul. She had a wound in her soul. And that spirit came to do a Psalm 143 on her to pursue and persecute her soul. And when it came... Then John 14 came into play. She had something in her soul that was in common with that spirit, so that spirit had power over her. Do you see it? When you have something in you that's in common, a spirit that's coming at you can pursue and persecute your soul, attach itself to your soul, and cause you a physical disorder. Amen? Okay. <music>
Have you ever looked at something too long? Uh, and, and when you close your eyes, you can still see it on your eyelids. Let's try that right now. John, do you have that? Let's try a little experiment. See that right now? I want everybody in here to stare at this image on the screen. John, tell me when 45 seconds are up. I want you to stare at it for 45 seconds. Because see, as you're looking at it, that image is gonna go into your eyes, which is, are the windows to your soul, and that image is gonna start getting burned on your soul. So keep going, because we're gonna go for 45 seconds. Don't stop staring at it. Right now, that light that's coming off of that is sending an image of it right into your soul. And you're going to see exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, now, everybody close your eyes and see if that image starts developing on the back of your eyelids. Give it a little time. Who can see it? Let me hear you. Yes, do you see that? Raise your hands again. How many people saw the image? That's how it works. Now, what did you see? Jesus' face, right? Yay. Now, imagine if you were staring at something you weren't supposed to be looking at for too long. The same thing would happen. The same thing would happen. That's how images get burned upon our soul. That's why in the Bible, the Bible repeatedly instructs us not to look at idols with our eyes because they are the windows to our soul. In Psalm 119, it says that we're to turn our eyes away from beholding idols. In Ezekiel 18, it says, those who do not lift up their eyes to idols will live. In Ezekiel 20, it says, let every man cast away the abominable things on which he feasts his eyes and defile, him, and defile yourself not with the idols of Egypt. See, the reason why God kept repeatedly telling us do not look at idols is because he created science and he knows how it works he knows that when the light reflects off of something that it will send an image of that something into the your eyes which are the windows to your soul and then eventually an image of that thing you're staring at so long can be burned on your soul just like a wound and then it will do the same things a wound does control your soul allow demonic powers to come and attach itself to that wound so that they can make you sick and they can afflict you now, it's interesting to know that that word eyes in all those scripture, it's not just talking about the literal eyes. It's also, it, it means in the Greek, the mind, the faculty of knowing. So that means that not only if you look at those idols too long, but if you think about them. How many of you have gotten, you saw something you really wanted and you just started to think about it? all the time. You caught yourself meditating on that thing. I really want that. Boy, that's really something. Oh, there's only one woman in here? Let's see the rest of you. The rest of you lying devils can leave. Let's see the rest. How many of you caught yourself doing that? Where you're thinking about something you know you're not supposed to have, or maybe it's too expensive, or maybe it's just become idolatry to you. It's a cosmetic procedure, or it's a clothing item, or it's a car, it's a house, or something, and you just can't stop thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it. You're more, you know what? The more you think about it, finally it will become engraved or burned upon your soul. And every idol has a demon spirit attached to it. It could be, you know, a house is not really an idol unless you make it one. Do you understand? If you're thinking about it all the time, then it's become an idol for you. And every idol is really a demon spirit. Psalms 106 says that the Israel sacrificed their children to idols. They served us and sacrificed to devils, meaning that every idol is really a demon spirit. So when you have an image of an idol burned on your soul, whether it's cosmetics or anything else, there will, a demon will come and attach itself to that image and begin to afflict you. Did you hear what I said? You can encourage me. Amen. <clears throat> okay. We're going to really talk about we're going to spend like most of these sessions talking about the sicknesses that come upon you when you have images of idols burned on your soul. But in this session, I want to talk about 
a couple of things. And one, that's how those images of those idols are affecting your life in the natural, how they're affecting your relationship with God, and how they're completely blocking and hindering your spiritual gifts. Okay? When you have an image of an idol burned on your soul, everything you look at, everything you hear, everything you see, <coughs> can be affected by that image. In fact, everything you hear and see You'll be looking at through the image burned on your soul. Let me give you an example in the natural. <clears throat> I worked at CBS television for years. And while I worked there, there was these television monitors in every room. And at the bottom of the television monitors were these digital time clocks. And they would be constantly running to tell you what time the program was running and how much time it had left. And so these clocks, because they were constantly running on the bottom of the screen, eventually they got burned into the screen. So even when you turned them off, you could see this clock at the bottom of the screen. Now every couple of years, they would sell the monitors for very cheap. Um, I picked up a couple, like 20 bucks each. Good TVs, great, I brought them home, good picture. But the problem is, is that everything you watched, you had to watch it through that burned clock. You did. How many of you have been to a, uh, like, you know, a TV place to buy a new TV and they told you, don't leave your DVD paused for too long on one picture on this brand new plasma TV because if you do, it's going to burn uh, an image of that picture on your screen. And then from then on, you'll be watching everything through that burned image. How many of you had that happen? That people have told you that? Mm-hmm. Yes, it's true. That's why God tells you not to pause too long by looking or thinking about idols because it will burn an image on that picture on the screen. And then everything that we think about, everything we see, everything we do will be affected by that image. You know, that's why people get divorced, you know, because they get together, they've been wounded in their life, and so out of the wounds, they begin to strike at each other. That creates more wounds. Pretty soon, maybe the woman starts going, well, I've had enough of this. She doesn't understand that it's in the soul. She goes, I had enough of this. But boy, that guy that works in my office, he sure is cute. And she starts looking at him and thinking about him and looking at him and thinking about him. And pretty soon, because she's looked at him for so long and thought about him for so long, an image of that guy is now burned on her soul. And remember, what's ever on your soul controls you. So pretty soon that image of that guy on her soul is controlling her and she's going, you know, <clears throat> I'm going to get a divorce because little do I realize that this image is controlling my will. <laughs> this image of this guy on my soul is controlling my decisions right now. But I'm thinking I'm doing the right thing because my husband has just been just... You know, I can't take him. He's so abusive and everything else and, and everything else he does. And besides, now I've found my true soulmate. That's what she thinks. And she really, 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 really thinks that. And she'll say she's got a word from the Lord about it. Because there's an image of an idol on her soul of that man. And it's controlling her decision to get divorced. Now, if they would have just soaked their soul and got their wounds healed, they'd still be married. That's right. That's why you see teenagers who watch excessive amounts of videos. Sometimes they can, you know, those, those really violent videos, and they play the violent video games. Sometimes those are the ones that you hear going and shooting their classmates. Because it started out there at school, and their classmates taunted them, maybe teased them, maybe picked on them, and that wounded their soul, right? Then they're at home, and they're doing the shooting up game and everything else, and they're totally addicted to these violent games. And then pretty soon the images of that violence coming out that TV, the light... TV's got a lot of light coming out of that TV, man, shooting right into the old eyeballs, the windows to the soul, burning those images of all that violence on the soul, and pretty soon it just seems like a really good idea to go and kill all the people in my school because the image was controlling those people, the images and the wounds, and that person's soul was controlling that person to commit those murders. You understand that, don't you? Yes. How are these images going to affect your ability, at your relationship with God and your ability to see and hear in the supernatural? I mean, remember the TV sets I bought, right? And they had the burned image of the clock at the bottom of the screen. If you had come over and visited me in those days and you decided to turn on a Christian television station to watch a Christian program, you would have been watching it, what? Through the burn, through that image. 
See, you don't understand. You're reading the Bible through the images of idols burned on your soul. And that's why sometimes you're getting the wrong interpretation. You don't understand. Sometimes when you're hearing from God, you're hearing, you're watching that program on the TV, you're hearing from God, but you're hearing it through the image that's burned on your soul. That's why sometimes when you get that prophetic word, it comes to pass and other times it doesn't. Because sometimes you're hearing from the spirit, but other times you're hearing from the, from the polluted stream of your soul, your wounded soul that has images of idols on them with demons attached to it. And it feels so power, that's really what it is. You feel so assured because that image is burned in there so deeply and you're hearing from it. You're seeing stuff in the spiritual realm that comes from the images of idols burned on your soul. Just like if you were to watch the program, you went home to my house and you watched the Christian program and you had to watch it through that burn on the TV, your seer vision is the same way. You're seeing, sometimes you're seeing things through the burn on your soul. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's why sometimes you're getting it right and sometimes you're not. That's why sometimes the prophetic word is right on the money and sometimes it's not. So that means that when we begin to get our souls healed, everything's going to shift. You're going to start moving in the gift. When you hear from God, it's going to be clear. It's going to be precise. It's going to be perfect. It's going to be pure. When you start seeing in the spirit, it's going to be exactly what's going on in the spirit. You're going to nail it. You're going to nail it. Everything that's in your soul is completely affecting your spiritual gifts. We think it's just about the spirit. It's not. It's about the soul. Let me tell you a story. A well-known pastor tells this story. He said a man in his church came to him and said that his son was at that age where he was, you know, talking to a make-believe friend. And his son was telling the father that the make-believe friend was really an angel. So the father goes to the pastor and says, you know, what do I do? Do I need to be concerned about this? Uh, what, what do I do about it? And the pastor told him, well, you know, do this. Next time your son's talking to his make-believe friend, ask the angel, ask him if you can ask the angel a question. And then by the answer, you'll know if he's really having an angelic visitation or not. So he goes, okay. So a couple of weeks later, he comes home and sure enough, his son is in the bedroom talking to his make-believe friend. So he goes in there and he opens the door and he goes, oh, hi, how you doing? I, are you talking to your friend, the angel? And he goes, uh-huh. And he goes, well, do you think I can ask him a question? He goes, I don't know. And he goes, well, let's try it. He said, can you ask him why I can't see him? And he goes, okay. Turns around and he goes, my dad wants to know why he can't see you. And then he goes like this. He goes, uh-huh, yeah. Like he's listening to the angel, right? He goes, uh-huh, yeah. And he turns around and he goes like this. He goes, he said it's because your eyes have beheld too much wickedness. Okay, I'm listening to this story and I'm going, the eyes, the windows to the soul. He's looked at too much junk and it's burned stuff on his soul. And that's why he can't see in the supernatural. That's why he can't see that angel. All freaking out. But the story's going on. Then, the, then the, the father goes like this. He goes, wow. He goes, um, can I ask him another question? Ask him if I'll ever be able to see him. And he goes, okay. He goes, my dad wants to know if he'll ever be able to see you. And he goes, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh. He turns around and he goes, he said yes, but it might take a while because you have wounds on your soul. And I'm going, I knew it. I knew it. Yes, he had wounds on his soul. His eyes had beheld too much wickedness, and it was blocking him from seeing in the realm. Look, our spirits are perfect, which means we should have absolutely no problem seeing in the spirit all the time, right? We have the spirit of Christ living in us. So how come we can't see in the spirit all the time? Part of the reason is because of what's in the soul, What's in our soul is blocking us. It's hindering us from receiving the signals that are coming from the invisible realm. Amen? Okay. <clears throat> Everything that's in your soul is going to affect your ability to receive from the Spirit. In fact, it's going to affect every spiritual gift that you have. 
what is in your soul can completely determine the level of anointing that you move in. When your soul, whatever's in your soul is going to affect your prophetic gift, your seer vision, your ability to hear from God, your words of knowledge, moving in uh, the miracle gift, the healing anointing, all that will be affected by your soul. Does the Bible say that? Yes. In 1 Corinthians 12 is the chapter that talks about the spiritual gifts. Starting in verse 8, it has a list, list of gifts that the body of Christ can move in. I'm just going to skim. Verse 8 says, to one is given the, a message of wisdom, to another, a word of knowledge, to another, wonder-working faith, to another, extraordinary powers of healing, to another, the working of miracles, to another, prophetic insight, to another, the ability to discern and distinguish between spirits, to another, um, tongues, to another, interpretation of these tongues. Then it says in verse 11, all these gifts are inspired and brought to pass by one and the same Holy Spirit who apportions to each person individually as he chooses. Okay, so every single person who's born again gets a gift. And what determines who gets the gift is the Holy Spirit who apportions to each person exactly as he chooses. So everybody gets a gift. And Romans 11 says the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. So Holy Spirit passes it out. And you get the gift, and it never gets taken back, ever. God does not repent and take the gift back. That's why it's called a gift. Now, check it out. If you were to be in continuous sin, then the gift would be dampened and probably would not produce the fruit that it's supposed to because of the sin. Amen? But when you get a gift, it doesn't get taken away. Now, have you ever noticed that some people move in a way higher level of the same gift than others? Some people might have a gift of prophecy and they're moving down here while some people are moving up here. Some people might have the gift of healing and wonder working and miracles and they're, you know, they're moving down here, but others are moving up here. Okay. What determines the level of manifestation that you get from your gift? Well, I'll tell you, one of the things is what's in your soul. Let me show you. In that same chapter, this is Paul talking. It's in verse 4 and he says this. Now there are distinctive varieties and distribution of endowments, of gifts, extraordinary powers that distinguish certain Christians due to the power of divine grace operating in their souls. Do you hear that? The extraordinary powers that distinguish certain Christians are happening to those people because of the amount of healing they've received in their soul. You see, it isn't all spiritual. We've got to get healed in our soul. Then we'll start to move in the extraordinary powers that this scripture is talking about. Does this have anything to do with images of idols? Yes. And it says it in the same chapter. In 1 Corinthians 12, in verse 1. Listen, this is Paul talking. He says this, Now about the spiritual gifts... The special endowments of supernatural energy. Brethren, I do not want you to be misinformed. You know that when you were a heathen, you once led off after idols. Yeah. Did somebody say ooh? Yeah, that's right. Do you think it's any coincidence that Paul is talking about the chapter that is discussing the spiritual gifts and he opens up that chapter by saying, look, as, as far as the spiritual gifts are concerned, I don't want you to be misinformed. You once followed after idols. Why is he saying that? Because he's saying that when you used to lift up your soul to idols, it caused an image of those idols to be burned there, a wound to be burned there, and it's going to affect your spiritual gifts. That's why a verse later he says, now the extraordinary powers that distinguish certain Christians come because of the grace that's operating in their souls. Meaning those guys who have the extraordinary powers are getting them because they had healing of those idols that were in their souls. Did you hear what I said? You know, this ministry carries a couple different gifts, and one of them is the word of knowledge, and the other is the working of miracles. And I want to tell you something. 
I'm not quite sure how it works. If you get the gift right when you're born, or if God gives it to you later, or, or I'm not sure of the timing or the process of that. So I'm not going to pretend like I do. No. But I know that those are gifts that I carry, so they were always predestined for me to have. Okay? But you know what? You know when they developed and they finally manifested in my life? I have not had them my whole life. My whole Christian life. I have not had those gifts. You know when they finally manifested in my life? When I started to get my soul healed. When I started seriously working on my soul, the wounds of my soul being healed, and the images of the idols in my soul being healed, that's when those gifts began to spring forth. It's true. It's true. And now, I mean, I can remember working on my soul for like a year and a half, two years, and all of a sudden I'm standing in a meeting one day, and we're doing the regular meeting like we always do, and all of a sudden... These words are coming into my mind. Ears opening right now in the name of Jesus. Pop, pop, pop. And I'm just repeating. I'm hearing ear opening. Pop, pop, pop. I'm hearing a uh, leg growing out right now. Right leg. And I'm just repeating what I'm hearing in my mind. And all of a sudden I said, did anybody get healed? Uh, just checking. <laughs> and up on these people. Yeah, when you said right ear open and you went pop. Pop, pop, right then I heard pop, pop, pop in my ear, my ear open. Next person up, yeah, when you said right leg growing out, all of a sudden, bam, my right leg grew out. All of a sudden, these words of knowledge started to flow, and the miracles that came with them started to manifest, and I can't help but notice that it happened after I started getting my soul healed. You understand there's, there's gifts waiting for you that are already yours, but they haven't manifested yet because of what's in your soul. What's in your soul is blocking the manifestation of your gifts. And let's say you already have a gift that you're working, that you've been um, working in, that you've been releasing, whether it's prophetic or whatever gift it is. I'm telling you right now, that gift is going to go from zero to Mach 10 when you start getting your soul healed. It's true. Great testimonies from inmates that get healed while watching this program. A guy wrote to us after having an allergic reaction that lasted seven weeks. He had swollen lips, trouble breathing, and an oozing rash. No matter what the prison did, nothing helped. He watched our program, then prayed the prayers, and woke up in his cell completely healed. More miracles like this will be possible with your help. Call now, and when you do, Katie would like to thank you for your gift by sending you a copy of her teaching, Kingdom of the Sun 7 Disc Set. With your gift of $50 or more, you will have a part in putting God's Word directly into the hands of a life that is ready to change. Call toll-free 1-800-789-7895. And as a thank you for your gift, Katie will send you a copy of Kingdom of the Sun. The Bible speaks a lot about idolatry. Even today, we make idols out of our families, jobs, and our possessions. Did you know Scripture connects blindness, deafness, crippling diseases, and inflammation with idolatry? When we get healed of the idols in our lives, we will see supernatural miracles in all those areas and more. This teaching includes a whole disc where I personally pray over your soul so that you can get your breakthrough. Call now with your gift, 1-800-789-7895. Help Katie reach out to thousands of prisoners with a powerful message of God's ultimate healing power. Give you some information. Okay, step one. Step one, the way you get to these wounds and these images of these idols is you first have to apply the blood of Jesus on the sin that made the wound or the sin that made the image. We've always really done that, haven't we? We've always applied the blood. And that's what you have to continue to do. You have to continue to put the blood on the sin that made the wound. And here's the thing. You don't, don't ever think you know what that wound is. You know, you'll go like, I know what the wound is. It's my husband. You know, you could be wounded with your husband because of what your father did to you. You don't know. God has an order that he's going to take you in to get your soul healed. Remember what it says in, in, in Proverbs 3. It says, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight and plain your paths. you got to go on his path. 
He's going to make it plain to you. He's going to show you through a dream or a vision or while you're reading scripture, all of a sudden you'll, you'll, you'll have a, a thought or a memory that the Holy Spirit will bring to you about something that happened when you were a child or, or, or something that happened you know, as, as an adult. But God will begin to show you the path. And that's when you go, oh, it was, it was when I fell off the horse, the trauma when I fell off the horse. Or, oh, it's when my sister and I got into a big, huge debacle. It's that. Um, and then you'll have a target to put the blood on. You can begin, you know, repenting for what your sister said to you, forgiving your sister, repenting for being offended at her. You can start putting the blood on that trauma. You can start putting the blood on, the, on, the, on that wound that that trauma made. It's just that sin, that trauma, the trauma is acts, acts like sin. So you can put the blood on it. Amen? But you spend focused time doing it. Don't just do like this. Oh, okay, it was my sister. I forgive her and I repent. Amen. Next. You don't do that. You spend time focusing on the cross. Focusing on what Jesus went through to pay the payment for sin. On how he shed his blood. On how he was beaten and whipped and crucified for us. You spend time soaking in his presence putting his blood on that sin, showing him that you recognize that he made a payment for it. Amen? Then step two. <clears throat> Once you deal with the sin, now you can get to the wound or the image of the idol that was made by that sin. What do you do to heal that? This step involves two powers that the church has not tapped into yet. What are they? They are the light of Jesus and his glory. You have to understand something. The light and the glory of Jesus Christ are literal powers. They're an anointing. Remember how those images got there in the first place. Light reflected off an object, sent an image of that object into your eyes, and it burned an image on, that so on your soul. If light in the natural can do that, can burn an image on your soul of an idol, then light of a supernatural source can burn away that image and heal it, right? Who is that supernatural source? There's only one. It's Jesus Christ. Because the scripture says that he is the light. Amen? And John 8, he says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not be walking in the darkness, but will have the light which is life. You see, Jesus is the light. And here he says that his light brings life. What does that mean? That word life is the Greek word zoe. It means the absolute fullness of uh, in life, uh, absolute fullness of life in God. But it refers to the soul. If you look it up, it refers to the absolute fullness of life in God for the soul. So Jesus is saying, my light brings life. My light will bring you the absolute fullness of life in God in your soul. Because my light is a power that is able to heal the soul. I want you to think about it. Jesus is the light of the world, right? The light that we, as we were looking at images of idols, and this light reflected off of them into our eyes, it burned an image on our soul. But what happens is we began to behold the light, Jesus Christ. What does the Bible call him? The image of the invisible God. So the light that literally comes shining off of Jesus, because he is the image of the visible God, the radiance of God's glory, will send an image of Jesus, bing, 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 right into your eyes. Just like when you looked at that picture up on the screen. It will send an image of him, and it will burn away all the images of the idols that are there. Amen? The light is a power. It comes from Jesus. And it causes an image of Jesus to be burned on our soul instead of the images of the idols. Listen, light has the power to heal your soul. Just listen to further proof in Isaiah 30, 26. This is in the Amplified. This is a prophetic word about a day when God is accelerating his light for the purpose of healing our souls. That day is now. In verse 26, it says this, Moreover, the light of the moon will become like the light of the sun. So see, it's talking about an acceleration, an intensity of light, that moonlight is actually going to become like sunlight. Then it says this, And the light of the sun will be sevenfold, like the light of seven days, concentrated in one. So there's more acceleration, more intensity of, of the light of one day becoming so intense that it'll be like seven days of sunlight all wrapped into one. 
Then it says this, it will happen in the day that the Lord binds up the hurts of his people and heals their wound inflicted by him because of their sin. See, that's why the light is being intensified. That's why God is releasing a revelation about the light of his son, Jesus Christ, and why the light is being accelerated and intensified. Because God has, has reached a point where he's like, no more. My people are going to have their wounds healed that came from their sins, and I'm going to use my son's light to do it. I'm going to heal my church. I'm done. I'm done my church being the tail in last place. I'm going to get them so healed they'll have nothing in their soul that's in common with demonic spirits, nothing in their soul that's in common with that problem with the ministry, nothing in their soul that's in common with their business situation, nothing in their soul that's in common with their finances, nothing in their soul that would allow any type of hindrance. Jesus. The light of Jesus and his glory is able to heal us. Can you stay with me just 10 more minutes? Let me show you. Malachi 4.2. It's a prophetic word about the power that the Messiah ha would have when he would arrive. The powers that he would carry to heal people. It says this, and the son of righteousness, meaning Jesus, arises with healing in his wings and his beams. So according to the scripture, Jesus uses two powers to heal. What are they? The wings and the beams. The wings and the beams. What are those? Well, the beams means beams of light. And you've already heard how light can heal. But let me show you in this scripture that it can heal not only your physical body, but your soul. It says that Jesus arises with healing in his beams of light. That word healing there is the Hebrew word marpe. It means to be healthful and be healed, to have a cure. So it means uh, there's healing for your physical body in the light. But it also means this, to be sound of mind. What's your, what's your mind? It's part of your, right. So the beams of light make you marpe. <laughs> they make you healed in your physical body, but also sound of mind, healed in your soul. Now that word marpe comes from the he, uh, Greek, a uh, Hebrew root word rafa, and it means to make healthful, meaning your physical body, but it also means this, to be healed of your personal distresses. Do you think soul wounds are like personal distresses? Yes. So according to this, the beams of light can make you rough ah, healed in your physical body, but also healed in your soul of your personal distresses. Amen? Okay, but what's the other thing? I said that there was two powers. That it says that he arises with healing in his wings and his beams. The two powers he uses to heal. Word of the wings. That is the Hebrew word kanaf. It represents the corner of the prayer shawl. In Hebrew tradition... The prayer shawl represents the glory of God because the Jewish people still get married under the prayer shawl because it represents them getting married to God under the pillar of glory cloud in the desert. I mean, even when it talks about in Hebrews, when it talks about the, the holy of holies room and the cherubim, it says the wing cherubim are over the, the, the ark that is in the holy of holies. And the Amplified in Hebrews 9, 5, it says this, that the winged creatures were symbols of the glory. So the wings represent the glory of God. You have to understand something. Light can heal your soul, but so can the glory. The glory can heal your soul. How many of you heard those scriptures in the Psalms that say that we find refuge under the shadow of his wings? Right? We find refuge under the shadow of his wings. It's the same word. It's kanaf. It represents the wings of the glory of God. And it says that we find refuge in the shadow of his wings. But if you read the whole scriptures, like in Psalm 63, it says this. I will therefore be in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul follow hard after thee. Psalm 57 says, my soul trusted in ye. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings I take refuge. When it talks about the shadow of the wings, it talks about your soul finding refuge there. Your soul why? Because under the shadow of the glory is healing for your soul. It's a power that can make you marpe and rafa. What does it say in 1 Corinthians 3? I think it's 18. It says that we are transformed into his image, into his likeness from glory to glory. What's that talking about? It's not talking about your spirit man being transformed from glory to glory. 
Because that happens instantly. It's talking about your soul being transformed progressively from glory encounter to glory encounter. Every time you worship the Lord and his presence or his glory inhabits our praises, there is a healing power. And that healing power is for your soul because it says your soul finds refuge under the shadow of his wings. It's a power. You have to understand something. It's a power. It's an anointing to heal your soul. Jesus. All right, here's my last story. Well, maybe not. <laughs> Two more. Okay. Let me give you a biblical example of someone in the New Testament who was healed by the powers called the glory and the light. Remember the woman with the issue of blood? Let's look at her story in Mark 5. Verse 25, and there was a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years who had endured much suffering under the hands of many physicians and had spent all she had, was no better but instead grew worse. She had heard the reports concerning Jesus. She came up behind him in the throng and touched his garment. For she kept saying, if I only touch his garment, I shall be restored to health. And immediately her flow of blood was dried up at the source and she suddenly felt in her body that she was healed of her distressing ailment. And Jesus, recognizing in himself that power proceeded from him, that it had gone forth, turned around immediately, looked in the crowd and said, who touched me? And the scripture goes on to say that the woman saw him looking to see who had touched him when he felt the power leave him. And she came stumbling out of the crowd and said, it was me. And he said, woman, go in peace. Your, your faith has healed you. That woman... That woman was sick in her body because she had a wound in her soul. How do I know? In Mark 5, it says that she was sick for 12 years. She endured much suffering under the hands of many physicians, spent all she had, was no better, but instead grew worse. Would that give you a soul wound? In fact, I think her condition came from a wound. Why do I say that? Because it says that when she touched the hem of his garment, she felt the blood flow dry up at the source. See, that's what a wound is. It's a trauma or a sin that happened to you back in time, back in your past, and it becomes a source. Because that sin or that trauma wounds your soul and it becomes the origin, the place, the source on which a demonic spirit comes and attaches itself to you and begins to make you sick. But when she touched the hem of Jesus' garment, the power that came out of him went all the way back to that place where she was first wounded, the source. It went back to the source and she felt the blood dry up. Amen? Now, what were the powers that healed her? It was the glory and the light. How do I know? Because the scripture says that she touched the hem or the wings of his prayer shawl. See, she was an Israelite woman. She knew the prophetic word of Malachi 4.2 that when the son of righteousness comes, he would have special healing power in his wings, that he would have glory, wings and beings, glory and light in his wings. So when she reached out and touched the wings, that scripture literally came to pass in her life. The son of righteousness, Jesus Christ, arose on her with healing in his wings, his glory, and his beams of light. Now check this out. Remember, when she touched the wings, what happened? Jesus said he felt power leave him, right? Power. Okay, this is going to prove to you right now that she had a soul wound. And that when the wound got healed, then she got the physical miracle. When she touched the wings... He felt power leave his body. You know what that word power there is in the Greek? It's the Greek word dunamis. It means the power to perform miracles and to be excellent of soul. That's what it means. See, she had a soul wound. But when he, she touched the wings and glory light was released on her, that glory light is what the New Testament calls dunamis power. And it caused her to be what dunamis means, excellent of soul. And when she got healed in her soul, then she was, 3 John 1, prospered and brought into health even as her soul was prospered. I want to see if I have enough time to tell this little story. Uh, went on tour. You know, the fastest way to go on tour is to, uh, to get healed is to go on tour with us. 
Not because we have a powerful anointing, but because um, everywhere we go, new spirits are there coming at you to do Psalm 143, pursue and persecute your soul. So every time you step on a new territory, a new spirit comes and goes, what do you got? What do you got in your soul? What do you got in common? <laughs> I'm pursuing and persecuting your soul so I can make you sick. <laughs> so they do that everywhere we go, right? For the first two years of tour, it was like, <laughs> I surrender. No, I don't. <laughs> it was hard because everywhere I went, the enemy found a new place in my soul where he could attack me. So now, a couple months ago, we had a brand new tour member join us on, on the team. And they went with us on tour. And we were at a meeting. And during the meeting, she became like the woman with the issue of blood. She began to pour out blood. Not just a little, but a lot in the middle of the meeting. Because why? Because a soul wound was being exposed in her. A spirit was coming to pursue and persecute her. So she goes back to the hotel. I'm talking, so I can't leave. And when we're done, we go back to the hotel. Bernadette and I walk in the room. It's like she, it's the, it's the winter time. It's freezing. She's got the windows wide open because she's being attacked so much that she's got such a high fever. And we're standing there going, going are you okay? Okay, well, I'll tell you what. We'll pray for you for our room. Bye. So we run into our room, and I'm now in the room, and I'm texting her. I'm praying for you right now. Hang on. <laughs> I'm like, just keep your focus on Jesus. Reach out and touch the hem of the garment. So all night, she's doing the, the, the steps. She's putting the blood on any sin that might have made that wound. She's, putting the, she's reaching for the hem of Jesus' garment. She's focusing on the glory and the light going to her soul to heal it. And she would drift off into a sleep, and then she'd wake up and hear my voice. Focus on Jesus. Touch the hem. She'd go, oh yeah, focus on Jesus, to Sam, okay. She'd go back to sleep, okay, and then she'd go back to sleep, and then she'd wake up again, and she'd hear my voice again, focus on Jesus, touch the hem. She'd go, yeah, the hem, the hem, okay. I'm reaching out for the hem, the glory light is gonna heal my soul, it's gonna make me do this, it's gonna make me be excellent of soul. Right now I'm reaching out, reaching out, reaching out. She falls back asleep, she wakes up a couple hours later, she's completely healed, the blood is dried up. <clears throat> Amen. One last story, and then I for sure, I I'm, I'm really am. I'm stopping. <laughs> I, I just want to tell you about, this is my seer vision, my personal experience with my seer vision. You know, I, I, I've always had seer vision, but I only get visions when I'm in a particular position. You, you hear the Bible talking about um, a deep sleep or a trance, right? Jeremiah went into a trance. Abraham went into a trance. Peter went into a trance. Paul went into a trance. And it's in that place you always saw them receiving visions. So when I go into that place where I let the Lord pull me into that deep sleep, I will get all kinds of visions. But when I'm up walking around, or at least it used to be like this, I don't get the visions. I wasn't getting them. And I was like, I'm so frustrated. Like, God, give me some of them visions like all these other women. They get hooked up. I see this, I see that. They're like, like, like an assembly line just ripping it out. <laughs> I go, I want some of that. And I said, why aren't I getting the visions when I'm up and walking around? He goes, because when you're up and walking around, so is your soul. And it's in the way. There's stuff in your soul that's blocking you from getting it. But when you're down, then the soul goes to sleep with you. And then your spirit man's just like, hey, here I am free without that bothersome soul trying to hang out on me anymore. Get back. Get back, soul. So I remember I started to fiercely soak that to put the glory light or dunamis power of Jesus on anything that was blocking my seer vision. And I remember I was fiercely doing it. I was decreeing that it was literally filling my eyes one day. I mean, I was going for it big time. And all of a sudden, in the natural, I felt a sensation. I felt these, like, what felt like little round toothpicks coming out of my eye, rolling out of my eye. I mean, it was such a powerful sensation of feeling this. I went into the bathroom. I literally went into the bathroom and pulled my eye down to look at it because I was sure I was going to see stuff coming out of my eye. It was that powerful. So then afterwards, I go in. I don't see anything. I go, what was that, God? And he goes, it's a log. I said, a what? He said, a log. I said, okay. So I go to one of those Bible sources online, and I put in the word log. And on the, on, the, on the search for the scripture, guess what it comes up? Check this out. Isaiah 44. In this chapter, it talks about how men would cut down trees, use the wood to warm themselves by the fire, then use some more of the wood to, like, you know, cook their meal. And it would say this then. In verse 17, it says, And what was left of the log 
he would make a god his graven idol. He'd fall down to it, he'd worship it, and he'd pray to it, and he said, deliver me, for you are my God. Now listen to this. But they do not know or understand. For their eyes, God has let become besmeared so they cannot see. See, I had logs in my eye. I had images of idols in my soul, and because of it, my eyes had become besmeared so I could not see. And by putting the glory, light, or dunamis power on my soul, it was beginning to burn those logs away. It was forcing them out. That's what I felt coming out of my eyes were those images of those idols, those logs that I'd used to carve an idol in my life were coming out of my soul. My eyes are the windows to my soul. They were coming out of my soul, and I was getting delivered. And I had that experience like over and over and over again, like 12 or 13 times after that, while I would be putting the glory and the light on my soul. And now, guess what? Starting to get those visions when I'm up and walking around. That's right. I was in prison the other day doing a meeting in prison, and I saw a vision. I'm like, everybody's there, and they're worshiping. I saw a vision. I saw a vision of somebody's neck. I saw the bones, and then all of a sudden, I heard like a, a screech of a car, and I saw the bones get torn apart, and the disc come flying out. And so I stepped up, and these girls don't even know what a word of knowledge is. They've never heard of that in their life. They've never seen a miracle in their life. I stepped up, and I said, okay, you might not know what I'm doing, but I'm getting a word of knowledge. I actually saw a vision, and all I'm doing is that God's showing me what has happened to somebody here, and then I'm going to speak it out, and you're going to be instantly healed. Are you ready? And I said, okay, I saw somebody's neck. And it was being torn by an accident. You got hit by a car, and the disc flew out. And I have a feeling that it was an accident that happened a long time ago, and it's causing you a lot of pain. And so now I'm going to command that pain to leave and for the disc to grow back and for your neck to be completely healed in Jesus' name. Then I said some more words of knowledge. And then I said, okay, whoever wants to testify, come up. My first person to come up. A woman, she had been in a car accident 20 years before. It had wrenched her neck. It had caused her to develop a degener degenerative disc disorder. She had had pain, excruciating pain, in her neck ever since then. And as soon as I saw the vision, said the word of knowledge, her pain completely was gone and she was healed. That's the end. Aren't you glad? No. No. But do you understand what I'm trying to say to you? You have hidden gifts that haven't even manifested yet. Or you have a gift, and it's moving at a level that God wants to take to a whole new place. He wants to open it up for you. He wants to put the pedal to the metal. He wants to open up the throttle. Do you understand? He needs you to be healed. He needs you to move in that extraordinary powers that distinguish certain Christians due to the power of divine grace operating in their souls. He needs you to get there, and he's going to make sure it happens. Now you know what the problem is. We need to go for it now. Amen? Father, I thank you. I thank you that as this revelation uh, gains strength, that the people in here are going to be empowered with understanding on how to heal their souls. And every part of their lives are going to change. Their relationships are going to change with their family, their friends, their loved ones. Churches are going to change. Marriages are going to be repaired and healed. Children are going to come back home. Diseases are going to be healed. Afflictions are going to break off. Giftings are going to explode. We're going to go to a whole new level in our gifts. And I hear, I hear people that don't have any seer vision are going to start getting it. I hear it right now. And so I decree that right now, that people that have not had seer vision are going to start getting it. I have dominion to say that. I speak to your soul, and I say, soul, get ready to be healed. I speak to every image of every idol in your soul, and I say, you're going to be burned away by the image of the invisible God, Jesus Christ. His light and his glory are going to go to the souls of everyone in here, and they're going to demolish the images of the idols that are sabotaging these people's lives. And I decree an infilling of the blood and the glory and the light. It's dunamis power. And that everyone in this room is going to become excellent of soul. And everybody said, Amen. Praise the Lord.